you going the other way. And sometimes the only thing that will hold you there is that word that God calls you in. I can even share with you. Excuse me. When the anointing starts, this is what happens to me. My nose runs like crazy. I can assure you that you better have that word, that you can fall back on it, and you have nothing else to stand on. Turn to Isaiah 61 if you brought your Bible, or if you're using electronically or whatever. You don't have to. You can pull it up if you want to. Isaiah 61, and it was also in Matthew, is the declaration of what the prophet, the, the Messiah would be and what he would do. And um, Luke is, I think it's in Matthew or Luke, that Jesus says he opens up the scriptures in the temple and he's supposed to read the scriptures and he stands up and he says, the spirit of the Lord is, of God is upon me and he's anointed me to, to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captives free, to give them beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning, to proclaim them the day of liberty, to something else for them that mourn. And, Proclaim the accept, oh, there it is, thank you, to provide for those who grieve in time and bestow them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise. Instead of a spirit of despair, they will call, be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for this display of his splendor. They will reveal the ancient. Now, watch, this is a long, long declaration. And then when you see it again in Luke, Jesus is saying it. And he's saying, that, and then he closes the Bible after he reads it, and he says, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Remember? Well, study your Bible. Point 4A. Know the word. Point 4A. Write it in big, big letters. Know the word. Because when you get out to the mission field and when you get to the world and you get to the elevator, you're not going to have time to show a power. You're not going to have time to, you may not have electricity to show up, get your outline up. You may not have your notes. You may not have a manuscript. You may not have your book. You may not have Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life with you. You may not have anything else that Jake told you. Are. These are tools, ministry tools. Know the word of God. Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. And baby, if you've got the word down on the inside, then you can bring that thing up. He said the word will be in you like a what? Tree of living water. And it will bear its fruit in due season. Come on, people. <laughs> due season or due time. You've got to have the word of God in you. Oh, this is a good workshop now. You want to go out to the, to the nations? You want to save the poor? You want to heal the brokenhearted? Pull that down so we can see verse 1. This is a scripture that the Lord gave me when, I, when he called me to ministry. And I looked and I thought it was so cool because I read verse line 1. That's the only part I was listening to. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to pray, preach in the King James Version says, to preach the gospel to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for prisoners, or it says deliver something from the blind in the King James Version. And that's all I read because I thought that was the only part that applied to me. But what I did not realize that over the course of my life and over the course of the next 10 to 20 years in ministry, that all of that was going to apply to me. That he was going to use me to do all of that. And the times that I wanted to give up and quit. And the times that I didn't feel qualified and didn't feel called and didn't feel anointed. And when my kids got in trouble. And when my husband acted crazy. And when I was going through personal hell. And when I was sick and broke and tired and beat down and hurt by the church. And sick of school and tired and sick and sick and tired and tired and sick and tired. And they kept telling me to pray and sing and watch and wait and pray and I was sick and tired of praying and watching and singing and working and praying and, and every time I put in my letter of resignation I'd lay down in the bed and the Holy Spirit would wake me up in the middle of the night and say the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has anointed you to preach the gospel to the and even when they call me for the job for the ambassador of ICCM I'm like I'm not qualified I've never even been out of a Country except on vacation. I don't know anything about missions and 
eradicating poverty, and I don't even know. Heck, I'm worried about the children in the inner city who can't eat. I do inner city ministry. I'm a pastor, urban pastor. I pastor churches in the worst parts of the inner city. And I was one of those ones that said, listen, how are you going to step over the people on your front porch to help the people across the city? But you know what? Once I got across the city and I saw that it was my responsibility that it wasn't either or, it was both and. And I need to find out what my call is, what my responsibility and obligation is, so that I can't don't sit there and figure out either or, but I figure out how to do both in it. And guess how I do it? When I do this, he does. Verse 2, when he says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. You know, that's a big task. How do you comfort everybody? Everybody that's in mourning? Everybody that's sad? You know, you go to these countries and you become overwhelmed with the need and you start thinking, let me pull everything out of my pockets and everything out of my heart and let me even pull everything out of my spirit. But then when you've done all that and you're empty, then what do you do? You have to know that I did all that I could do. And you really have to know that I did all that I was purposed and called to do. Sometimes your responsibility is not to save the whole world. It's to preach the gospel to the poor. Sometimes it's just to put a pen out on a table. Sometimes, you know what God even had to show me? Because you know he showed me this great vision when I first got called to ministry that I was going to be out and I was going to preach to the multitudes and masses and he showed me that I was going to speak and people would be slain in the spirit and I just had all this anointing and power and you know he was like, uh-uh, you're not ready because you're too excited about it. And so he said, you know what? I'm going to do what I called you to do. I'm going to show you, but you know what I want you to do first? Go to Habakkuk and write the vision and make it. Write the vision and make it plain. Set it up upon a table so that they which read it can run with it. And we often use that scripture for when we start a new program at church that we're going to write it down so everybody can see it and run with it and get on board. I propose that the vision that needs to be written and put up on a table so that they which read it can run with it is for you. You write the vision and make it plain. And set it up on a table so that every day you can get up <laughs> and you read it so that you can run with it. Isn't it funny how many people in the Bible did one little thing and changed everything? I propose to you. God has called you to be a world changer. That God has purpose and a plan for your life. Not to harm you, but to prosper you. To bring you to an expected end. To give you hope and a future. He is going to use you to eradicate poverty. That's why you're here. He is going to help use you to stop anti-trafficking and slavery. He is going to change your health. He is going to anoint you to feed the poor and clothe the naked. He is going to use you to do missions. He is going to use you to save the world and change the world. He is going to use you to change your family. He is going to use you to change your circumstances. He is going to use you to do inner city or suburban or rural ministry. He is going to use you to sing or to teach or to pray or to play. He might just use you to be an artist or a musician, a speaker, a pastor, a teacher. He may just anoint you to be an intercessor. And that's not just a, that's a major thing because when you don't have an intercessor, he said, I look to and fro upon the earth and I found no intercessors. And that's when the whole earth was in array. You know when the worst time in my ministry ever was for me was when my intercessor died. An intercessor is a great assignment. Nobody wants to be the intercessor because they are behind the scenes and they're not out front. They're not seen. And 
they, they toil and travail for somebody else and their servants and their, their people that stand in between hell and heaven and hold back what my pastor called hold back hell hounds from the work of the person that's up front doing the ministry. But what happens is the intercessor's not there. Why are you here? I propose that Matthew 18 says that if you, it would be better for you if a millstone hung around your neck and you'd be cast into the sea to, to allow any one of these little ones, little in the faith, little age wise, to be offended or be hurt. I propose to you that the best way that you can start doing that is by finding out who you are, what your assignment is, what your call is, and what way God wants you to do that. You will kill yourself trying to save the whole world in your own strength. You will burn yourself out trying to do ministry that's not your call and your fit. You will fry out quicker than chicken in hot grease if you are just using all your strength and all your energy in, in something that God didn't call you to do. Not that you won't do good work and not that people won't be helped, but there's nothing people. There is nothing like putting your foot in the right spot. When you get in your room, I'm the operations manager for CD at the World Ministry Center. I'm the ambassador for ICCM. I was an assistant pastor at the church. I was an inner city pastor. I've been an evangelist. I've served as a teacher and a prophet and a blah, 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 blah. I'm a mom and a grandma. I mean, I've done it all. I've been a hip hop artist. <laughs> <laughs> I can rap. <laughs> I've been a heathen and a hellion. I've done everything. But you know what? No matter what I do, no matter where I go, no matter what I try, I get pulled right back to this thing that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And sometimes that's not just money poor, it's spirit poor. It's, 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 it's joy poor. It's vision poor. It's provoking poor. If you came in here in a blah, I hope right now your spirit is like, like, oh my God, that lady's crazy. But you know what? I can't believe you're the same. And no matter what job or assignment or position or place that I'm in, I know that the spirit of the Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel, to preach the good news, to preach the word, to tell somebody, to stir up in them, hey, the oil of joy for morning, to give you beauty for ashes, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he said, if I, if I be lifted up on the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. So I could push, push, push programs and, and, and statistics and all kind of stuff on you, but you know what I'm anointed to do? <laughs> Preach the gospel. Hopefully I do that today. Hopefully you're stirred. Hopefully you're feeling challenged and motivated and you've been to a workshop that said, you know what, I have not, cannot leave out of there the same. You know what I pray before I preach? Every single time, Lord, let them not see me, let them see you. Let them not hear me, let them hear you. Lord, be glorified, exalted, and Father, let them leave here forever changed. Don't let me leave. Stir up something in them, God, that changes their life. And not because I preached it, because you preached it through just the message. But I never want to be a preacher or a proclaimer that just says a bunch of cute little things and then you leave and say, oh, that's so sweet. You don't remember a word that I said. And I always want to preach a word that wasn't just my testimony. Not that anything's wrong with people to do that. Maybe that's their particular calling, because that is necessary for the right situation. But I want to be one that when you leave here, you say, boy, i got to learn the word. When I leave here, I need to know what my calling is and what my vision is. 
I need to know the scripture that's going to back it up because when I go through hell, I'm going to need a word from the Lord that helps me hold on. When I get ready to quit and throw in the towel, when I feel myself drowning, When I feel myself drowning, I'm trying to save other people. When I'm trying to pull other people out of the pit from the pulpit. When I'm trying to get people activated and motivated and stirred and I'm bankrupt. When I'm trying to give joy and I have no joy. When I'm trying to lay hands on the sick because the word says that I can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover and nobody gets recovered. Or I'm sick while I'm laying hands on the sick. When I'm trying to believe that he's a, a bridge over troubled water. When he's a mind regulator. When he's a counselor. When his, the government is upon his shoulders. When I'm trying to believe that and proclaim that I need to know God that you I want to know what I'm called to do. And you know what else? Point five. Along the way of trying to figure out what you're called to do, you know what's easier to find out? What you're not called to do. <laughs> Point five, find out what you're not called to do. Look, I am not a youth pastor. Trust me. <laughs> Can I preach a youth revival? Heck yeah. Can I do a youth event? Sure. Can I hang out with the kids who I love kids? Absolutely love them. Am I their youth pastor? Heck to the no. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't do that. That's my children. My children will tell you my mother doesn't do OPKs. You know what OPKs are? Other people's kids. <laughs> Not for long. She does short term. Short term ministry. I preach. <laughs> Long term, youth pastors have to be consistent forever and love being around kids and love, but find out what you're not called to do. That helps you get to what you are. I think my time is up. Is it? I have 10 minutes. I'm finished. When the Spirit, when the Spirit says speak, you speak. When the Spirit says stop, you stop. You do know. Well, you may not know, but start with 25. Like I said, and write down what you know you're not called to do. Mm -hmm. You do know you kind of know that? Mm -hmm. That helps eliminate a lot. Because yeah, a lot of times what we do is we do what we're not supposed to do, trying to figure out what we're trying to do, what we're supposed to do. Yeah. Or we do things out of professionalism rather than out of calling. Mm -hmm. Well, I need a job, so and they're hiring for this, so I'll take that job. And sometimes you have to do that. I mean, but it's at least recognize that it is what it is. Okay? Don't get stuck there. And I think uh, human trafficking, anti human trafficking, is a passion for me. Mm -hmm. I'm just not sure where I need to be used. Okay. Start with that baby right in front of you. Have you sponsored a child before? Mm -hmm. Start there. Start praying for that child. Start intercessing for that, interceding for that child. Start. Asking God to show you, give you dreams and visions about that child. And if it's human trafficking, start saying, Lord, how do I, what do you want me to do? Open up. You know what? The Bible says that God will open doors that no man can shut, and he closes doors that no man can open. And so you have to begin to ask God to open the right doors for you and close the doors that you're not supposed to go into. Matter of fact, God, get me out of the rooms that I'm not supposed to be in. Close those doors and don't let me go back in there because you know how we are. We're hard-headed. Oh, you know you're not supposed to be there. You know your season is up. The fruit is withered on the tree. The grass is brown. And you're still there. Hi, I'm here. And you hate it. You dread it. You don't like the people you're around, but you're still doing it because you've been doing it for years. And so-and-so did it, and now you have to do it. But it's really not your place. The Bible also says that your gift will do what? Will make
generation will come that moment. Your gift will make room for you. Don't know. Look it up. <laughs> it is in there. Your gift will make room for you. Yes, ma'am. Wasn't Moses didn't get called until he was like 80? He was. Yeah. He was old. He was. 47 is not old. It's yeah. not. 47, 47 is not old. Now, it's not the new 20, I'll tell you that, because my body is telling the truth about that. The 47 is like the start of some new things. Oh, I know. You know what? Let me share this with you. My kids, my kids are, um, my daughter's 30. I have twin boys that are 28. I have a 20-year-old, and I have five grandkids. And my life just started. I am just the coolest Jaja in the world. I picked my own grandmother name. My grandmother name is Jaja. I'm not a granny, nanny, nanny. And that I'm Jaja. Ja. I figured out if I told my oldest grandkids I'm a preacher, so whatever I say, it shall be the past. <laughs> so I told my oldest granddaughter, call me Jaja. Ja. My name is Jaja. Ja. She just she said it, it's stuck, it's going to carry on for generations and generations. And so, um, what was my point? But my life is just starting. I just bought a motorcycle last year. I took a motorcycle class. And so now I'm riding. I love I'm getting that patch. It says these are my church clothes, my leather vest. You know, I, I'm just saying that. And and even the the ambassadorship in ICCM, the being able to travel around the world and come to conferences and preach and pack a bag and roll out and roll back. You know, all of that is just starting for me as a grandmother of five and a mom of four. And I've been married before and I'm not anymore. And so I'm just saying that don't ever underestimate God. For every time, there's a purpose under heaven. Isn't that Ecclesiastes? There's a time and a purpose for everything under heaven. A time to live, a time to die. A time. It's a season and purpose. Yes, ma'am. Is it Lamentations? No. Ecclesiastes. No. I know that. <laughs> Can you find your gift will make room for you? Ah! Ah! She's the bomb. <laughs> Proverbs 18:16. A man's gift made a room for him. And bring them before what? It does what? Look. Come on, people. Can you see it? A man's gift. This is the King James Version, but same thing. A man's gift make it room for him. And does what? And you know what? He says, um, be careful how you entertain strangers. For you could be entertaining angels unaware. And you may not think it's a great man, but I personally happen to believe that I'm standing in front of some great, amazing men and women who are world changers right today. I believe that my gift has made room for me and brought me before you who are great men and women of the gospel, great men and women of the kingdom, and I'm making an impact that's going to make an impact on the rest of the world. See, we think, oh, I gotta go get 10,000 children sponsored. No, I need to get one person to think about their calling and their gift. And that one person is gonna impact a thousand people. And those thousand people of that 10,000 people. And if all of you in here go Facebook or Twitter or tweet or say something about what you learned in this workshop, guess what that does? It spreads the gospel throughout the world. So I accomplished what I was called to do. You don't even know how he's going to do it. And you don't know where he's going to do it. And I'm telling you, what he showed me that he was going to use me to do, even with that scripture, 18 years ago when he called me into ministry, is completely different than what I'm doing right now. I was a sis, I was an associate minister at the Baptist church, got called to preach at the Baptist church. And you know, we don't believe in women preachers at the Baptist church. Now, nah. <laughs> you don't believe. Well, now, nah. we don't believe that God uses women like that. You can fry some chicken, but you cannot preach the word. <laughs> well, well, well. But God called me at the Baptist church. And right when he was calling me, he was changing my pastor's heart about believing that God could use women in ministry. And everything was, I'm telling you, God was orchestrating everything behind the scenes. And here I'm trying to figure out, well, God, how am I going to tell these Baptist people that I got called to preach? And we don't believe in women preachers. He said, look, Tasha, 
You deal with the part I gave you to do and let me handle the rest. I got this. I'm God. I'm sovereign. I'm large and in charge. And all the time since then, all I've done is when he opened the door, I stepped in it. And if that door lined up with what he was telling me and calling me to do, I watched and saw my opportunity and what I was supposed to do in it. Even when I came to this conference, I said, Lord, I know this workshop. I know you don't want me to just sit there and give them statistics and statistics and slideshows and PowerPoints. Now, some people use, God uses them that way. It ain't me. This is how he uses me. And I'm telling you, 18 years later, I'm doing, I pastored in the inner city church. At the Baptist Church, you know what my responsibility was as an associate minister? For the first year of my ministry, I was anointed to preach. He gave me a sermon. He was giving me sermons before he gave me the calling. I was writing them in a book because I thought they were for my pastor. I had the scripture, the title. I even knew where to raise my boy. I would practice in the mirror. I would practice in the mirror. And when he was doing, you know what I did the first year of my ministry? Held the sheet up over the communion table. I, didn't get to, I got to preach one time. And I held the sheet up in the back of the church. You hold the white sheet over the communion table. And everybody comes up and they get it in white gloves and go out and pass it out. But you hold the sheet up because it's holy and you keep that veil between the holies of holies and the congregation like the temple set up. And so my job as an associate minister for the first year was to hold the sheep cheerfully and joyfully in my black suit, my white shirt, my white gloves. My black stockings and black shoes, because that was the acceptable uniform. And the Lord told me, he said, you know what? If you be faithful over a few things, then I'll make you ruler over many things. And I faithfully, joyfully held that sheet up. He said, oh, the Lord loves a what giver? Cheerful. A cheerful giver. So don't sit there and hold the sheet like this. <laughs> I held the sheet like this. I gave my service. I did what I felt like I was called to do in the opportunity where the Lord made room for me where the door was open and I held that sheet cheerfully. And guess what? Then I got to preach. Then I got to teach. And then I'm putting the Lord called me to the Free Methodist Church. Lord, it's been history. God bless you. Any more questions? No? We done? Time up? Time up. I made it. I didn't think I had that. God bless you. Again, don't forget if you want to fill in and can sponsor that child, just bring me the yellow or orange slip that's in the back. Fill them out. You can bring that up to us at the front. Um, we'll contact you about setting up payment arrangements. You don't need to give us any money today. And if not, you can just leave it right there on your desk. And we also have a table out in the other building, the admin building, where you can look at other children or if there's a different child you want. You want to take all of them because the Holy Spirit told you to. Make sure you do and just bring me the slips. God bless you. Thank, you. Thank you, guys. Did you get something out of it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. Good worship? Good yes. I don't have a church to be born. I don't have You know, for me, the whole purpose of going to church is to be transformed and to be mm -hmm. equipped and to be changed and to grow and to mature and be conformed to the image and the likeness of Christ. And if that doesn't happen when I go, it's be a world changer, people. Love you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. It's not old. 47 is young, honey. And I have my grandchildren. I do too. Thank you. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you. Work in inner city schools.